22. Okay, well, we'll begin again. <laughs> Good evening, as we're letting people into the room, uh, the piece you saw coming in was selected by our speaker this evening, Professor Sergei Zhuk, and he'll explain more what that piece was. He was quite keen to, so, to show some resistance uh, songs and resistance music. Um, we sorry that you couldn't hear the music, but I think seeing the video, seeing the scenes was very important. Uh, I can be corrected, but I believe that was the Ukrainian flag, um, and which will, I'm sure, uh, be part of what uh, Professor Juk talks about this evening. I want to say welcome. My name is Dr. Betty Tanzi, and welcome to the 2022 Carl Gaywater Great Decisions Program, which is a major program series of the Indiana Council of World Affairs and of WACA the World Affairs Council of America, and is the largest forum in the United States um, where people gather to talk about foreign policy and, and, and global interaction in the United States. So welcome. We think we have a very unique one here in, in Indianapolis. <clears throat> but we've been gathering now by Zoom for the last couple of years, and we will probably be returning to live next year. The not, not this program year, but I think we're distinctive unique because we have great engagement. Our speaker will be presenting for about 30 minutes this evening. You all, many of you are used to that. And then we have a very robust Q&A. We've been um, here in Indiana for close to 70 years, prior to the Foreign Policy Association, which has been around for a hundred years. I know you've heard this story before, starting after World War I when we were an isolationist nation. And this was an attempt to try to help Americans become much more familiarized through credible informed programs uh, with their engagement on what was going on in the world and how it mattered to the United States and to Hoosiers. Uh, I'm a member of the board of directors. We are a volunteer working board of directors. And with me this evening is, uh, is the Great Decisions Committee. And the um, person that we'll be introducing this evening will be Dr. Ray Montano. If Ray could just say hi, so we know where you are, Ray. And, and Diane Farrell it can say hi. Diane is on our committee. And uh, Claire Collins is with us. And uh, Claire, ever so often, the, the, many of you who bought the publication that comes with this has marvelous maps. And Claire loves to give us great clarification on those maps. And um, uh, Let's see what else I want to say here. I um, call it as opened the door for new engagement for us. It has expanded our audience and also expanded our speakers and where we can reach them. And we really appreciate that. Before we begin the CD's program, and again, to thank you for coming. Um, we ask if you if you have enjoyed these programs, and we know you have, you let us know you have, will you please consider being a member? And if you can also, if you're a member, if you could please consider a small donation. Uh, we try to keep our costs low. You've been able to come to Zoom for free. And that's been a really great service. We've enjoyed that. But we do have our costs. And we want to continue doing this for as long as we can at the quality that you have come to expect. So your support for us, for those of you who have not become members that are supporting us, and have done that just recently with 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 our with how we broaden our, our engagement. We want to thank you very much. It means a great deal. For those of you who are coming and you've not had a chance to do it yet, please consider it. Your support for us allows us to continue on bringing you these excellent programs and to expand that outreach. Um, so with that, I would now like to, we have a fantastic program this evening. It could not be more timely. I think for those of you who know, we're given the list of topics our, our distinguished speaker program is one where we can sort of say what's timely, what's urgent, let's have a program on that. But we're given the series of eight programs by the Foreign Policy Association. They begin thinking about these the summer before, and we get them about April for a February, uh, I'm sorry, at August or September for a, a February program. And um, uh, when we saw the one on Russia, we thought, oh my gosh, we've talked about Russia before. What, what could be happening now with Russia? Well, a lot. And we have a lot to talk about this evening. Our, we've had a great conversation so far, and I can't wait for you to hear what he has to say. And with that, Ray, would you please introduce our speaker? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Betty. Yep. Uh, before I begin, uh, I will also be moderating the uh, Q&A after uh, Sergey um, completes his, his remarks. And if you would, send your questions to me. And my name is there under my picture there, Ray Montagno. And I will uh, kind of moderate the questions. If you would prefer to ask the question yourself, just let me know and I will, uh, you can ask the question personally, but we just sort of want to 
manage that process a little bit. So if you could send your questions or your request to ask a question uh, directly to me, that would be great. And I'll, I'll send a, a chat message to everybody to remind you about that. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Sergey. Uh, Sergey is, is a uh, former Soviet expert in US history, uh, especially in social and cultural history of uh, British America. Uh, Sergey moved in 1997 to the United States and he uh, completed his PhD at uh, Johns Hopkins in Russian history in 2002. Since 1997, He's taught uh, American colonial history at various universities. He currently is a professor of history and on the, a member of the uh, European Studies program at uh, Ball State University. He's also taught at the University of Pennsylvania, John Hopkins and Columbia University. His research inter interests include international relations, knowledge production, cultural consumption, religion, popular culture, and identity in the history of Imperial Russia. Ukraine and the Soviet Union. Uh, Professor Zook's scholarship was awarded numerous research grants, including the Kennan Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, Rockefeller Foundation, the Bellagio Center in Italy, a Fulbright Mellon Foundation, and numerous other uh, grants and awards. Um, he recently uh, finished a number of publications on, uh, on Russia and the United States uh, relationship. It is our pleasure, pleasure to welcome Sergey to the Indiana Council for World Affairs. Uh, thank you, Ray, for offering me the opportunity to speak to our Indiana audience. And um, I planned, I need to explain that I planned this talk a uh, few weeks ago and we spoke as well, we discussed with Ray what I'm going to do uh, during this talk. And we decided that I, um, uh, will follow my uh, oncoming book on the KGB operations against capitalist America and uh, capitalist America for Soviet Union and Russia in um, 70s, 90s uh, was uh, United States and um, Canada. But everything changed in a few days, actually. I uh, decided, I, I tried to... Uh, check all these new events and I decided that my talk is a very good illustration of old traditions of uh, so-called uh, Russian meddling or Soviet meddling in American politics and Russian acts of disruption. And uh, uh, I need to understand that to some extent that this is uh, uh, my personal vendetta uh, uh, I uh, lost a few students of mine in Ukraine during the first Putin's attack on uh, Ukraine in 2014. And I was not very patriotic before this. I was typical you know, American Ukrainian, uh, enjoying life in Indiana and everywhere, going to opera, uh, enjoying sports and so on. But when uh, suddenly, neighboring Russia, where I had my relatives uh, and um, colleagues attacked us and uh, killed my uh, students, very good, but by the way, students, I just said, no, I need to dig in and show to entire American world, including my students, my faculty here at Bull State, the roots of this kind of behavior. And these roots are in KGB background of the recent new leader of Russia, President Putin. So this was the origin of this idea. And uh, I tried to explain this in my presentation, how it related to the recent events, to um, new war. Actually, it's continuing war against uh, Ukraine which unleashed by Russian Federation, by Putin, personally by Putin, who rejected uh, even the thought that Ukraine could exist as independent states, obviously. When, uh, when you listen yesterday to his presentation, Putin's presentation to his speech, it, it, he rejected uh, Ukraine existence. So I try to share some of my discoveries, which for many of you will be very interesting um, uh, parallel stories of what is going on now in Eastern Europe. 
And I start with uh, my uh, archival work and uh, my interviews, which I uh, began in 2004 and finished in 2019 with my archival uh, job in KGB, SBU archive. SBU in Ukraine means Служба Безпеки Украины, Service of uh, Security of Ukraine. Uh, in 2015, after uh, revolution of Maidan, uh, this archival materials were uh, open to uh, wide audience, that, and I used this. So since Stalin rule, the Soviet communist leadership tried to influence American politics on behalf of the Soviet political interests. As Georgi Arbat, a director of the Institute of USA in Canada and Moscow, and political advisor to Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev, noted in 2002, I quote, Soviet leaders were always looking for various ways how to influence US domestic politics, beginning with funding American communists, then supporting the Afro-American and American Indian movements, and finally assisting American politicians with the obvious pro-Soviet interests. And this strategy of interference in the US politics became more efficient with the beginning of cultural academic exchanges in the US and USA in 1858, when the first Soviet guests had begun visiting America on a regular basis, the end of citation. Another Soviet political advisor and director of the Grand Center of American Studies in Kyiv emphasized that the beginning of such exchanges under Khrushchev and Brezhnev intensified the different strategies of Soviet meddling in American politics. During the detente in the 1970s, I quote him, Soviet leadership began an intensive interference in the life of various ethnic communities in Northern America, especially Ukrainian community in Canada and the US. And another Soviet expert in Russian-American relations, by the way, my mentor, Nikolai Bolchavikinov, a pioneer in Soviet American studies, Soviet Americanist, confirmed the Soviet administration became especially interested in finding the new ways how to influence American politics. Since the 1970s, the international ASOBI, KGB controlled departments of Soviet academic institutions had begun to require from all Soviet visitors to the US to report the detailed information about the existence and character of pro-Soviet politicians and organizations in America recommended all Soviet Americanists who are traveling to America to establish connections, personal connections, with the representatives of Native American and Afro-American movements, the end of citation. During the Cold War, especially in the Dayton period of the 1970s, institutionalization of various academic centers for American studies in Moscow and Kyiv in Soviet Ukraine was used by the offices of KGB and GRU military intelligence to create cover positions for themselves to invite American policymakers and academics to the Soviet Union and to undertake intelligence-related missions to the United States. Even the first group of four Soviet students of American studies who participated in the initial academic exchange with Americans at Columbia University in 1958 included three professional Soviet intelligence officers, uh, two uh, KGB officers, one of them uh, famous uh, Alek Kalugin, by the way, probably you know this name, and one from GRU, from military uh, intelligence. American, of course, were aware of this mission from Soviet research centers, which sent their representatives to the US to spy and to interfere with American politics, the end of citation. According to the published Vasily Mitrokhin archive, uh, archival files, uh, these documents uh, brought to the West by the KGB archivist. The most influential KGB man among the Soviet experts in US politics who visited uh, many places in the uh, uh, United States, in Indiana, um, was Georgi Arbatov, director of uh, this famous institute, or infamous institute of USA and Canada. Arbatov, who had the KGB code name of Vasily Bezel built up an influential circle of high-level contacts in America, and he was regularly required to cultivate these connections. One of the most important of Arbatov's contacts in the 1970s was former Under Secretary of Defense Cyrus Wentz, codenamed by the KGB as Vizier. By the way, I look through 
these files, they still exist in Kyiv archive. And uh, you'll be shocked how much Arbatov and other Soviet guests used information from the conversation with American politicians like Cyrus Vance. In 1968, the KGB organized a financial support of a Democratic presidential candidate, Hubert Humphrey, a vice president to Lyndon Johnson. Many of you now watching uh, this series, CNN series about Lyndon Johnson, and probably you remember the story of Hubert Humphrey, but CNN did mention a fact that the Soviet Union tried using KGB connection uh, to bribe Humphrey and finance his campaign. And uh, this was a real KGB operation of 1968 uh, because uh, Soviets were afraid in those days of anti-Soviet rhetoric of Richard Nixon and the Republican Party. Um, I found, uh, you know, piles of uh, these um, documents about uh, KGB trying to um, bribe um, Hubert Humphrey advisors, inviting them to Kiev, um, giving them some kind of gifts and so on. But eventually they changed uh the emphasis and uh they became became uh very friendly with nixon administration trying to support nixon everything changed after nixon tried to establish the friendly relation with the Soviet leadership uh, and personal with uh, brezhnev arbatov and other kgb people from moscow and kiev tried to help nixon administration during watergate scandal and later on they attempted to collect compromise information about the anti-Soviet hardliner, National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski, and disseminate this material in American media. And they did this. All these actions of KGB people were part of an old Soviet tradition from Stalin's times to meddle in American politics and discredit the United States. These actions include not only various efforts to support and finance American communists and other anti-establishment political groups, but also to spread disinformation, so-called fake news, forgeries of documents and visual materials and active propaganda through sympathetic individuals and front organization, I quote from KGB document. The major goals of Soviet meddling in American politics uh, were to undermine and discredit American democratic political order, and at the same time, to undermine the international prestige an influential role of the United States in the world affairs. According to my own research in KGB archive in Kyiv, through the entire period of post-Stalin socialism, the KGB operatives still dealt mainly with the intelligence from the main adversary, the United States. Even um, small KGB operatives, young small operatives, Vladimir Putin, who lived in East Germany, still uh, targeted United States more than West Germany in those days. According to the official counterintelligence research in Kyiv, a number of the spies from the USA always dominated over a number of the spies from other capitalist countries. Thus, in uh, January, August of 1969, there were 133 cases of espionage in Soviet Ukraine committed by foreigners, according to my calculations. 74 of them were committed by Americans, 12 by Englishmen, 19 by French, and 11 by West Germans. This was a typical ratio for the KGB operations against the Western intelligence and the Soviet Union. During the 1970s and 1980s, more than 60s of all recorded and uh, reported KGB counterintelligence operations in Soviet Ukraine targeted the US and Canada only. Why uh, US and Canada? Because four. Uh, KGB, as you realize from rhetorics, yes, the rhetorics of Putin, the most dangerous uh, threat came from Ukrainian community living in uh, America. And uh, a majority of the Ukrainian diaspora lived in two countries, in Canada and United States. So uh, this was a major uh, adversary of uh, uh, Soviet KGB. And uh, when I started 
uh, my research, I realized that KGB already became famous or infamous for organizing special campaign and very successful operations in uh, United States, which affected actually economy of America as well. I just gave you a sense before uh, going to my uh, figures and my facts. Uh, the most famous and the most scandalous operations and successful operations by KGB uh, in America. The first, the Operation Cedar of disrupting power supply of both the US and Canada in 1859 and 1973. By the way, Indiana economy and Indiana connection to uh, Canada uh, was targeted by this operation. And uh, Indiana lost uh, money uh, as a result of this KGB operation in 1973. Another, discrediting the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, in 1973-78 using, uh, for example, historian Philip Agee, who was codenamed Pond by KGB, who was bribed by KGB. And the KGB used different films, different uh, publications, including publication of novels, probably you remember film, Three Days of the Condor. And in 1974, according to KGB statistics, over 250 active measures were targeted against the CIA alone leading to denunciation of agency abuses. And, and in fact, uh, KGB-1, um, uh, US Congress, as you remember, had special hearings about these abuses using sometimes falsified information from KGB sources. Another operation, Operation Pandora, which planned to stir up racial tensions in the United States between Afro-Americans and Jews in 1871 by mailing bogus letters from Ku Klux Klan placing explosive packages in so-called, excuse me, my language, Negro section in New York City. And they actually succeeded. Uh, we had uh, clashes between uh, Jews and uh, Afro-Americans uh, during those years. Another operation, planning and promoting claims that both John Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated by the CIA. And uh, these claims uh, were spread in literature, in different media, in uh, uh, novels, in films, and so on. Another operation, discrediting US military aid to the El Salvador government in 1881-84, trying to make it so unpopular within the United States that public opinion would demand that it be halted as a result 150 committees were created in the USA, which spoke out against US interference in El Salvador, uh, and the direct contacts were made with US senators. And again, KGB won. Um, these operations were revealed and criticized by American politicians. Studying rumors that fluoridated drinking water was in fact applauded by the US government to affect population control. And I'm finishing. Uh, another uh, scandalous um, operation was fabrication of the story that AIDS virus was manufactured by US scientists under CIA direction at Fort Detrick in Frederick, Maryland. My own first shocking discovery in the KGB archive was about a significant number of the KGB spies sent to the US and Canada from Soviet Ukraine during the 60s and 70s. And again, it's an official document now available to anyone. According to the annual KGB reports, the most important goal of KGB administration was to prepare the well-trained agents for the intelligence work abroad. Only during one year of 1969, the Ukrainian KGB sent its 23 agents in various international organizations located in the USA. 200 KGB agents traveled in the USA as a research specialist collecting the intelligence information. 40 KGB operators worked abroad for hiring the foreigners, mostly Americans, as the future KGB agents. Three KGB agents had been already implemented in the US intelligence, CIA mostly. Two were implemented in the Zionist and clerical groups in the United States and Israel. Altogether, 292 KGB agents were engaged in the counter intelligence operations against the Ukrainian national centers in the USA and Canada living there. 
The similar numbers were reported almost every year in the 1970s as well. Almost every year during the 1970s, KG managed to infiltrate approximately 250, 270 their agents into various diplomatic, academic, media, and business organizations in the United States and Canada, creating so-called the sleeping cells there for the future intelligence work of the KGB and group. Uh, they still exist here in America. Moreover, today's success of KGB, Russian FSB, tried to use the Russian immigrant Slavists in various centers of the Russian studies in America and Europe to promote the pro-Russian and pro-Putin notions. Just look at the American, you don't need to go to archives. I recommend to my, uh, my uh, audience, look at the American Russian participants in Valdai Club, it's KGB, well, FSB, uh, Federal um, uh, Service of Security in Russia, Valdai Club, or Ruski Mir, Russian world, Ruski Mir Foundation, just go to Google, and you will find the names of some very famous American British political scientists and scholars who always criticize Ukraine, always uh, support Russia, always write about Russophobia in America and so on. My second discovery was about the KGB influence in the domestic politics of the US and Canada. It was a real Soviet meddling in American politics using the KGB office uh, from Soviet Ukraine. I I'm, uh, use um, Ukrainian documents. And its struggle against the Ukrainian nationalists in America, the Ukrainian KGB tried uh, to use American Ukrainian left pro communist activists. Ukrainian Canadians, members of the Communist Party of Canada, became the useful tools of the Soviet KGB meddling in the Ukrainian diaspora affairs in America. And you need to understand that 50% of uh, all Canadian communists are Ukrainians. And they were used by the, for example, one of these guys with the name of uh, Petro Kravchuk um, was uh, manipulated by KGB and um, he was used for criticism of ver various campaigns, um, uh, you know, anti-Soviet uh, campaign and um, these uh, Ukrainian American Ukrainians and Canadian Ukrainians were used by embassies in Ottawa and Washington, the Russian embassies for their uh, pro-Soviet campaigns. Moreover, uh, KGB tried to support uh, these uh, pro-Soviet communists um, uh, in different way. Um, their children were controlled, uh, enrolled in various educational institutions in Kyiv. Um, as Kadevis noted, special arrangements were made in hospitals, sanatoria, and resorts to accommodate uh, those members who required medical uh, treatment or rest. In 1859, for example, using the Soviet financial support through KGB agents in Canada, Canadian Ukrainian communist leaders such as Kravchuk founded their own capitalist enterprise, Ukrainska Kneha in Toronto and new international tourist company, Globe Tours, to provide travel facilities for those wishing to visit the Soviet Union. So in this way, KGB uh, supported these guys and helped them to make money using these Soviet connections. And uh, the Soviet government granted to this company in the 60s the legal rights to be the only official representative of the Soviet travel agency in tourist in Canada and guaranteed it an exclusive monopoly on group travel to Soviet Ukraine. Another element of the meddling uh, with overall Western political life and especially the US politics was the KGB support, uh, including its financial funding of various progressive, meaning pro-Soviet political movements and parties in capitalist West. Almost every year, the KGB files provided information about the special KGB assistance to the numerous anti-war movements in the West and to the friendly communist parties in the West, especially to the communists in the United States and Canada. Even the organization of Black Panther Party, which started in 1966 in Oakland, California, attracted the KGB attention because it was a dynamic, I, I quote uh, KGB document, dynamic 
Negro organization, they use this language, which posed a serious threat to America's ruling classes. According to the official KGB report of 1970, there was a discernible tendency, I quote, among the Black Panthers to increase cooperation with progressive organizations, including communists, which are opposed to the existing system in the United States, unquote. Therefore, the KGB administration, as early as the 1970s, suggested the Soviet political leadership the special KGB active measures regarding this organization. I quote, because the rise of Negro, it's a uh, language of the document, sorry for this language, because the rise of Negro protests in the United States will bring definite difficulties to the ruling classes in the USA and will distract the attention of the Nixon administration from pursuing an active foreign policy, we would consider it feasible to implement a number of measures to support this movement and assist its growth, giving them money and support uh, their growth in uh, various places in the United States. Employing the possibility of the KGB in New York, especially New York and Washington, we need to influence the Black Panthers to address appeals to the United Nations organization and other international bodies for assistance in bringing the US government policy of genocide towards American Negroes to an end. It is likely that by carrying out the above mentioned measures, it will be possible to mobilize public opinion in the US and in other countries to support the rise of American Negroes and thereby stimulate the Black Panthers into further activation of their struggle. And you will see a number of actions and uh, uh, moments of support, including financial support of Black Panthers movement in the United States provided by KGB. And uh, I, I will uh, concentrate on the one case, which I describe in my book, on kind of book about KGB operations, um, how KGB agents use Black Panthers against Ukrainian community, Ukrainian diaspora in, uh, in America. The KGB agents in the USA targeted the historically Black colleges and universities, especially in the Washington DC area. They tried to find the most radicalized Afro-American students who supported the Black Panthers movement and used them for various pro-Soviet actions, including the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations with participants of the students from Harvard University during the 1970s. The most successful operation by the KGB agents on Harvard University campus were devoted to various actions against the American Ukraine meetings and demonstrations in Washington, DC. Usually, the KGB uh, agitators engaged Howard University students, black students, in these activities by disseminating the leaflets and various literature about the racist and fascist origins of the Ukraine diaspora in America, ideologically discrediting and portraying all American Ukrainians, I quote, as the militant anti Afro-American and neo-Nazi group. Sounds familiar? Uh, Putin used the same uh, rhetoric uh, against Ukraine now, which was a real threat to all Afro-Americans and Jews in the United States. In some cases, the KGB managed to involve the Black Panthers followers from Harvard University to disrupt and disperse the American Ukrainians demonstrations in downtown DC. The most famous attempt to provoke a physical conflict between the Harvard University students engaged by the KGB agitators and American Ukrainians in downtown Washington, D.C. was prevented by the local police on September 16, 1984. The KGB agents tried to discredit the anti-Soviet actions of the American Ukrainian activists at Taras Shevchenko Monument in downtown Washington, D.C. on September 16, 1984 which tried to mark the 20th anniversary of the official opening um, of this monument in the USA against forceful rustication of Ukraine. And the American Ukrainians planned even to attract the Afro-American students from Howard University for this occasion, spreading among them the information about friendship between a great Ukrainian poet of 19th century, Taras Shevchenko, and American Black actor Ira Aldrich of 19th century. Eventually, the KGB succeeded in disruption of those plans using disinformation about so-called fascist and racist nature of Ukrainian nationalists 
spreading various leaflets and pamphlets about the KGB, uh, about the Ukrainian white racist, racist among the black college students in their dorms at Harvard University. As a result of this KGB operation, the black pandas became involved in this conflict with the alleged Ukrainian racist and fascist in America. And I continue on and on with all these operations to disrupt America, to disrupt uh, political order, to bribe uh, and use American Canadian politicians in Soviet interests. But I want to finish my uh, conversation with you with parallels of the recent politics and uh, uh, KGB or FSB actions today about today's disruption. Uh, probably uh, our audience forgot that um, uh, these uh, disruptions or operations of Putin regime against uh, Russian neighbors, against America, still follow the same models of divide and rule, discreditation, uh, bribing, and so on, models of KGB operation from 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I will give you a few examples of uh, Vladimir Putin disruption, especially after two, uh, 2001. First, Russian interference and meddling in politics using cyber attacks, using attacks, computer attacks, uh, former Soviet republics. I just gave you three of them, Moldova, Georgia, 2008, Ukraine, 2004, and present, uh, 2014 and 2022. Um, as you remember, physical or cinematic uh, physical attack uh, against Ukraine in uh, Donbass um, had prehistory of so-called cyber attack on Ukrainian banks and Ukrainian ministers of foreign affairs and so on. Second. Russia used the Soviet legacy of the old Russian civil war of 1918-1920, such as the creation of separatist states in the neighboring states. Uh, for those of you who forgot Soviet history, I just remind you that Lenin's regime and Bolsheviks, Trotsky, Lenin, Stalin, used the so-called separatist states in Ukraine, by the way, Donbass Republic, was communist republic which they used against uh patriotic nationalist movement in kiev in 1919 and eventually bolsheviks won uh, they moved this separatist group which they plan to do today from east from donbass uh, through kharkiv to uh, kiev and uh, they defeated uh, petlura regime patriotic regime in kiev in 1920. So today, uh, they use the same strategy in Pridnistrovia, in Moldova, Ossetia in Georgia, 2008, and DNR and LNR in Ukraine, Donetsk uh, Independent Republic and Lugansk Independent Republic, um, plus annexation of uh, Crimea was uh, used um, in the same, um, uh, using the same model. So, Another uh, famous um, case of meddling uh, was old operation of FSB using political um, uh, organizations, especially right groups, fascist, neo-Nazi, neo-fascist nationalist groups in Austria, in France to divide the European Union, to weaken the European Union. They used even um, parties which supported uh, 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 very pacifist courses, uh, protection of uh, environment, and so on. Um, but still, uh, according to um, these um, results of operation 2014 to 2017, uh, FSB succeeded in uh, promoting their interests through some of these uh, neo-Nazi, uh, neo-fascist, and uh, very nationalistic groups in France and in Austria and in uh, Italy. All of them had funding 
as uh, funding of uh, from FSB from Russia through uh, Russian oligarchs and so on. Another uh, case was a recent Russian interference in US domestic politics, especially the attempts to remove using uh, both Democratic and especially Trump Republican administration to remove Sergei Magnitsky rule of law accountability act in 2012 and especially to remove anti-Russian sanctions of 2014, 2015. They especially targeted um, Republican administration of Trump and of course his presidential um, campaign of 2016. So it's just a few recent example of these similarities between old traditions of KGB operations and a new uh, strategy of post-Soviet regime, Putin's regime and um, Russian Federation. The story of KGB meddling in American politics during the Cold War, I'm finishing, is an important reminder for us that the post-Soviet politics still uses the old KGB models. Not only models, Belarus still have, uh, has the same organization with the same name, KGB. The most important difference, however, is the rise of the more dangerous, unlimited rule of the former KGB officers like Putin. Again, you need to understand that in Soviet times, KGB activities, KGB operations had limited character. They were controlled by Politburo of the Communist Party, by different collective groups, not like Putin, who becoming the authoritarian leader, undermined the traditional and predicted stability of the traditional Cold War politics and its balance, which used to exist before 1991. This new trend, personified by the Russian President Putin, is making the new Cold War not only more cold than the previous Cold War, but also is push, pushing the new global order to the brink of the new real hot nuclear war, God forbid. Thank you very much. I'm ready to okay. answer your questions. Yes, thank you very much, Sergey. Uh, really appreciate that, especially some of that historical perspective. I guess I had forgotten this. I was alive then and you know, I really didn't understand quite the uh, a level of uh, interference that was going on back then. But uh, yeah, so we have a, a number of questions. I, I think Betty actually got her name in first. So uh, let her ask her question first. Uh, yes, um, before everyone came into the room, we were just talking briefly about this. Could you comment please on, uh, we, 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 we want to be careful not to cast Russia under just one monolithic. All of Russia feels the way Putin does right now. But we had an interesting discussion on this because I've been concerned about seeing my own Russian friends wanting to express my views, what I see, but I don't want to offend them. And then you had an interesting comment. If you could just, how does, how does Russia feel right now? If you can just comment. But you also said something at the end, if you can comment also on number two. Well, do you think Putin will use nuclear capability weapons in his um, most recent quest with Ukraine? So two things, uh, how, how do you feel Russians in general feel about this? And number two, do you think it'd be so crazy to actually use nuclear weapons? Uh, you need to understand that uh, Russians, uh, ordinary Russians probably uh, are against this war. It's, it's uh, madness. But you need to understand the other uh, aspect of Russian situation. Any opposition, any political opposition, any criticism is suppressed. And this serious matter, you would lose your job as a teacher in school, or, you know, professor at the university, if you criticize open this regime. So uh, all remnants of resistance now put by Putin into jail. Navalny is the last case. So even if you're against war, uh, probably you can do anything against this. So uh, despite the fact that probably Yan and the most active part of Russian uh, westernized population are, is against the war, it's obviously, but uh, Putin does not care. 
you, you need to remember that we're dealing with very authoritarian uh, regime, which had nothing uh, in common even with Stalin's regime. You, you need to remember that Stalin had Politburo. Stalin had a certain kind of limitations. And uh, Stalin was um, uh, driven by uh, Marxist ideology, internationalist ideology. Despite all these cases of Russian nationalism, he still didn't want this war between brotherly nations, uh, tried to keep this union together. Uh, by the way, uh, actual Russification started after him, although he killed Ukrainian opposition during uh, the 30s. But Putin is dealing with a very different situation. Stalin didn't care about money. He cared about ideology, about communism. This guy cared about his influence, his role in um, textbook of history. And uh, uh, he wants to uh, leave this uh, message, to leave this image of Putin as recreator of Soviet Union. Um, this feeling of humiliation, many of us, I, I came from, so you had these feelings before, but uh, in this KGB agent case, Putin's case, it became obsession. It became obsessed with this idea of being humiliated by these uh, Americans to restore this pride and glory of great Russia. So it's interesting combination of Soviet, uh, pretensions and claims with old Russian imperial complex. And unfortunately, uh, we're dealing with a person who didn't want any control, who very isolated. And I suspect that this COVID situation affected his brains as well, who knows. But he's now a very dangerous person. Uh, so it's another answer to your question. Will he use nuclear weapons? Of course, God forbid, but who knows uh, what happened with crazy person who obsessed with this American domination. If you listen to his speech to this um, crazy Randy, uh, yesterday, it was America which was guilty. America should be punished. He even didn't mention any agreements with uh, Ukraine. Ukraine is pretext to attack Americans. It's dangerous development. God forbid, uh, I hope that uh, he will not be using this. But again, you forgot that he has no limitation to his power and he does not care about sanctions, even if they affect his oligarchs. He hated oligarchs, he didn't care about this. What he cares is his role in history, um, restoration of Soviet order, stability. And of course, this corrupt, small, Americanized nation of Ukrainians is mm, just prevention, is obstacle in his huge plan. And to understand his um, mentality, his uh, philosophy, I recommend uh, to read his article, which was published uh, on uh, Kremlin's site, official site, in July last year, where he already explained his strategy. And uh, what he uh, declared yesterday, it was a repetition of these ideas of his article. Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus is one Slavic, Islamic people with one ideology, or else Greek Christianity, and the West tried to divide us. We need to uh, combined efforts to create this Slavic unity. And of course, who's guilty? Of course, corrupt Americans who corrupted, already corrupted Ukraine. But it's, it's, it's crazy, it sounds crazy, but unfortunately it's true. Mm. So I had a, a question here uh, from John Marquis. He was curious about this uh, Russian behavior at the Olympics, the doping of this young lady and just kind of the historical doping and and poisoning of uh, agents and, you know, these sort of mi mi what might seem like minor issues. You know, what, how does this play into the whole Russian mentality? Yeah, it's, it's old uh, Soviet, it's not Russian, it's old Soviet tradition. 
Uh, many people in the West could understand that Olympic uh, uh, teams from Soviet Union were not, um, you know, former students who decided to to become a sportsmen. Uh, no, they were professional sportsmen. Soviet Union invested money in sports teams, in hockey, in soccer, in uh, gymnastic. And of course, they used various labs of the theological warfare, which uh, were open in the 50s by Stalin in the major uh, socialist countries in East Germany. They still exist until um, collapse of Soviet system in 1989 in Eastern Europe, in China. By the way, Wuhan was famous Stalin's center of uh, biological weapon. I, I, I surprised that uh, nobody mentioned this, criticizing uh, China and um, problems with um, uh, spread of COVID. So doping was part of everyday life in Soviet sports. Um, but Soviets tried to bribe uh, Olympic Committee, tried to um, deceive Olympic Committee through 80s and uh, after collapse, that always tried to um, corrupt uh, these bureaucratic organizations, but they failed. Eventually, uh, some members of Russian team um, had these relations about uh, using uh, doping and so on. So it's typical uh, Soviet system of um, boosting energy of their sports and so on. So what happened uh, in uh, Olympic games, they actually lost control of the doping of this uh, young girl. It was and not dominant, she probably used um, this medication. But uh, again, it's not her fault, it's fault of those uh, leaders in Russian sports committee who uh, control her, who, who monitored uh, sure. And um, it was another case how um, this um, uh, bureaucratic leadership in Russian sports still used the old measures. But it was a shame that this talented girl Hugo claims to become, you know, number one uh, figure skating. And uh, at the same time, we witness this typical authoritarian type of leadership when your coach you know criticize your you know use very nasty language criticizing your faults so uh what happened in uh olympic games it's typical post-soviet tradition in uh russian sports practices today right. uh thank you uh lois meyer had a question about uh, the countermeasures that uh, the United States and Western countries use against Russia are the kind of methodologies similar, or how would you how would you judge the quid pro quo and sort of spying? Um, you know, they uh, they were successful until the 90s, but then uh, we have this uh, friendship between Clinton and uh, Yeltsin area when uh, some of these CIA operations were forgotten and uh, we have a different attitude to these people. And unfortunately, um, these countermeasures failed. Uh, many uh, KGB uh, successes like uh, targeting uh, CIA and FBI agents like Ames uh, case and others uh, were victories of um, KGB or FSB in the 90s and failures of CIA. Uh, frankly speaking, in my book, I um, analyzing uh, early CIA operation with Germany in 40s, 50s, and early 60s, I showed how these CIA operations failed, uh, not only because of um, a success of KGB uh, measures, uh, but also because of betrayal of uh, various um, uh, ideological sympathizers of Soviet regime. You remember Cambridge Five, uh, MI6 people, 
some uh, people who shared these communist ideology and sympathies towards Soviet people because of the war in, in America. Unfortunately, all CIA operations against Soviet Ukraine uh, failed. I uh, tracked them down uh, from uh, 49 until 56, all of them failed and uh, KGB succeeded. So I would not be, I wouldn't idealize um, uh, CIA countermeasures. Again, I, I need more archival research, and this will be my next book about uh, KGB operations against Ukrainian, KGB CIA operations uh, against um, uh, Ukrainian uh, community, Ukrainian diaspora in America. But uh, still, we need to be careful with um, this appreciation of CIA efforts. Unfortunately, CIA sometimes could not understand logic and mentality of those Russians. Uh, like in the case of uh, Putin, uh, you know, it's uh, to some extent, it's a great mistake of American intelligence after Cold War when they lost control of this rise of new Tsar KGB um, officer Putin. I need to understand that, KG, that uh, Putin is a unique case in KGB legacy. Putin had no good career in KGB. He was just small operative with uh, rank of major colonel. Um, and he always felt that he's not big enough. Paradoxically, for Soviet reality, especially in Leningrad, when he was working for Sobchak, for mayor of the city, gave him an opportunity to become a leader uh, of regional KGB and then, uh, or FSB and so on. So again, you need to understand the psychology of small man, who's very small, who uh, was not so talented, like Kalugin, for example, general of KGB, who knew languages, uh, putting language skills and his uh, erudition is not great like uh, uh, former KGB officer Schwartz told us recently. But still, uh, CIA had to study his character and analyze, and they lost this control. Why? And I explain why. Because too many Americans were busy to enrich themselves in post-Soviet Russia. And Russians, especially Putin, used this American greed to use them, to provoke them, and exploit them. And eventually they created scandalous cases demonstrating that all these Americans are greedy, uh, you know, capitalists who didn't care about Russia, who flee in Russia and need to be punished. And, uh, you know, this famous Robert Case uh, who wrote this Red Notice book about uh, funding our financial system for Putin. Americans did this, but at the same time, Americans were involved in the system and made money. And Putin used this, uh, you know, capitalist greed to discredit these people, to create this um, kind of compromise. And compromise or compromising um, people is very dangerous tactic. I, I said, again, I did not um, study uh, new documents. Uh, what I did, I, I read books uh, written by those Americans, people from intelligence community um, about Putin, but obviously they missed something. They lost control of Putin. And Putin became the new Tsar of Russia. Yeah. All right, so there was a kind of a, question you, you mentioned earlier about the, the movie Three Days of the Condor. And uh, uh, I, I recently read that, reread that book and watched the movie. Uh, yeah. what, what, it's what my exactly, favorite movie, by the way. <laughs> what exactly was the kind of the uh, KB, KGB involvement in that? Or? Um, again, I, I found just few documents and I didn't want this because a lot of written by Americans about uh, these uh, uh, say scandals, 
probably uh, who old enough uh, uh, remember all these um, uh, Congress hearings about CIA operations and scandals, uh, which were used for, for this novel and for the book, uh, Three Days of Condor. Uh, but what KGB did, uh, they used uh, leftist part of um, American press and uh, leftist part of uh, American creative intelligence, uh, like Oliver Stone, for example, giving them uh, information about uh, El Salvador, uh, provoking conversations about uh, CIA involvement. By the way, Oliver Stone made a wonderful film called Salvador. It's about these scandals, by the way. Um, and uh, they promoted this, uh, the, the publication of this uh, novel uh, about this um, Condor stuff was translated through KGB connections in German, in Dutch, in uh, Swedish. And it was published or republished, reprinted in all European uh, capital cities. Um, uh, film was bought by Moscow International um, uh, Festival. I referred to the film with, uh, uh, I forgot this guy. Uh, uh, but anyway, it's, it's a Pollock, Sydney Pollock film, uh, which referred to. Uh, and uh, this film was shown all over Soviet bloc, in Warsaw, in Berlin, in, uh, in Moscow. And the KGB actually created special promotion of this film in Europe, in China, in Africa. Even in Australia, they had this public showing of this film. Hmm. And uh, you'll be surprised how many of these KGB agents were uh, included in official delegations of Soviet filmmakers who <laughs> promoted uh, Sydney Pollock films. So mm. you need to understand it was a uh, typical KGB operation. For example, KGB collected information about participation of uh, some Ukrainians in Nazi operations during the World War II. Uh, and they uh, provided all these archival documents and even film material to Canadian and American Jews who made film about Nazi atrocities in Soviet Ukraine committed by these Ukrainian nationalists. So in this way, uh, KGB try on the one hand to discredit Ukrainian community in Canada and US showing them as Nazi, as fascists. On the other hand, they try to divide Jewish immigrants and Ukrainian immigrants, you know, create this war between these two communities in um, US and Canada. They failed eventually, but they tried. And I, they show these films and uh, they use New York Times, uh, Baltimore, uh, and many other uh, 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 newspapers uh, for giving the scandalous documents to local American journalists. And they publish this. Uh, and uh, to some extent, they worked for KGB, even unknowingly, but they still were included uh, in this uh, KG, in this KGB plan or KGB operations. Hmm. In my book, I, I mentioned some of these uh, operations in Canada and in, in Ukraine in the 80s and uh, 70s. There's a question from Gary. He said, I understand, it's kind of a philosophical question. I understand that Putin was a disciple of a philosopher named Ivan Ilyin, yes. who he quotes extensively. Ilyin is associated with the rise of fascism. And do you think that Putin moved from being a communist to a fascist, or was he ever a communist? You know, it's another very important uh, difference between Putin and Stalin. Stalin was never Russian nationalists, you remember. Stalin was a, a, a Georgian, Gruzid, uh, Jugashvili, uh, with all his uh, uh, artificial creation of this Russian cult during the war, during World War II, still Stalin, uh, with all his anti-Semitism uh, after World War II, he was not nationalistic. Why he was anti-Semitic? Not because of Orthodox uh, uh, Krishna Brini, no, because he planned to create 
communist Israel, and for some reason, his operation to use uh, Jews, uh, Jewish immigration in Israel for communist cause failed, and they became pro-American. For him, it was, you know, uh, punch, uh, individual uh, attack against his plans, and he became anti-Semitic. And for, people sometimes forgot that the reason for anti-Semitism was this failure to use Israel as communist regime in Middle East. So you're right. Uh, Putin is a different case. And I think that his nationalism was shaped, especially after collapse of um, the Soviet Union. And you need to understand why. It's a result of his humiliation. You know, this small guy who tried to become big, uh, taking these classes of judo, of the sambo, you know, wrestling classes. He tried to be bully, being very small and very vulnerable. This guy lost everything with the Soviet Union. Uh, he tried to reestablish some economic connection, making money using his German connection, but it was not enough. And in this situation, when you are humiliated, you try to find any kind of ideology which justified your anger, your feelings, and such ideology uh, was ideology of Russian nationalism. Uh, and he had many sources. Some of them came from his teachers from Leningrad State University. He, he was a student in the school before becoming a um, uh, KGB officer. Some of these sources came not only from Ilin, but also from Dugin uh, writings. Dugin is a crazy guy. Uh, I knew him personally. It's a guy who uh, tried to uh, recreate uh, so-called Eurasian theory, emphasizing unique Islamic road in history uh, as a bridge between the West and Asia, Eurasia. And um, as a result, he criticized all those Western powers who tried to uh, punish uh, uh, Russians. By the way, these guys, even before the of Soviet Union and Putin shared their views, argued that Alaska should be returned to Russia. Why? <laughs> because Alaska was taken by Americans in 1867 from Russia. And it's not true. My mentor, Nikolai Bolchavitna, wrote a special book about the chase of Alaska. And he showed how Russian diplomats tried to bribe members of US Congress because Americans didn't want to buy this barren land in those days. And why uh, Russian uh, diplomats tried to persuade American Congress to buy this because Russia was isolated as a result of Russian failure in the Crimean War. But people like Putin or uh, Dugin didn't, was, were not interested in the historical facts. They tried to use Alaska case as example. Or you see Americans, even in the 19th century, Americans uh, you know, cheated on us. They took our land. And uh, then they uh, gave other examples of American imperialism. But we forgot that during the Civil War, entire Russian North was occupied by American troops. And people from Michigan, by the way, from our American Midwest participated in suppressing Russian revolution. And of course, for people like Putin, it was another example. Oh, you see, these Americans, all this, try to exploit us, to punish us. So this anti-Americanism has very different roots, starting with his education in Leningrad uh, University in the law school. It's very nationalistic law school, but Russian oriented. And um, then uh, these ideas of the Yin and special Dugin about Alaska, about um, American imperialism from early 20th century influenced him, yes. It's very different mind, set of mind comparing to Stalin. So Stalin was ideologically driven. He was a communist. He tried to build this communist you know, world 
um, uh, even uh, with his war efforts, you know, punishing America, but still, and he was very careful with uh, these operations. But Putin is different kind of enemy. And unfortunately, CIA um, a failure that they lost control of the rights of this. And plus, you need to understand that uh, Russians had tremendous support of Trump. You, you probably do not understand the triumph of Soviet Russian KGB, even first time in history. Soviet KGB officers were invited by American president in those days it was President Trump. Nobody did this before Trump. And official representative of Russian FSB, former KGB officers, went to White House, were welcomed by American president, who actually criticized American politicians and FBI director Comey, official. It's on, on, uh, on tape, you can watch this. On. It's a shame. That's why all KGB and Putin celebrated victory of Trump. And of course, they hated uh, other candidates. It's not Republicans or Democrats. They loved Trump. Probably you don't know, but you can find this on YouTube. What kind of celebration Zhirinovsky and Putin organized when they had this crazy news that Trump won. Entire Moscow was paralyzed. They had these fireworks. They had concerts applauding victory of our man. It's official rhetoric of Zhirinovsky and Trump. It's a shame. And um, I assume that many of CIA uh, apparatus, FBI apparatus, were ashamed as well. For them, it was, you know, failure to get KGB office, Kislyak, his professional KGB office from 80s. I knew him uh, as a student who had all these uh, strange anti-American uh, speeches written. Kislyak was invited to, wait, well, I stopped. I just uh, I need to emphasize there was failure of official intelligence in this country that they allowed Putin and Kislyak to use American weaknesses, American divisions, and build this threat in Eastern Europe now. Sorry about this gloomy picture, <laughs> but unfortunately uh, we're dealing with a very nasty character. Yeah, somebody, Jack Gannon, suggested that the uh, author of the article in our briefing book thought that the uh, KBG or the KGB, yeah. uh, FSB involvement was actually broader than just getting Trump elected. Is that? I agree. What is your take on that? I agree. Um, and again, you need to understand that um, uh, we sometimes ignore cyber attacks uh, by uh, FSB and GRU uh, from early, uh, it's from 1990s, late 1990s, GRU and FSB created special schools of uh, computer specialists who used uh, cyberspace for attack. Um, uh, if you analyze Facebook content in 1916, uh, excuse me, 2016, you'll be shocked how many of them, again, it's very easy, uh, you know, um, um, people, computer scientists have this notion of megadata, and anyone from us can use this uh, going to the source of, original source of any video of any link you just go to google and uh, click click and you will see and all these links of pro-trump sympathizers and anti-hillary clinton um you know posts came from one source russian source again it's uh, a lot of books were written but uh for some well i understand why americans especially republicans didn't want to read them because these books uh, undermine their major cult figure, you know, um, so Trump. And it's you, another very interesting paradox. Trump. Uh -huh. Some of these pundits, like, uh, uh, what's his name there? Uh, 
Tucker Carlson and so forth. Why, why are they kind of supporting Russia in, in this? Well, uh, uh, they did not support the Russia. They support, you know, uh, they didn't like Clinton. They didn't let, uh, like Democrats. And I, I understand why, because of corruption, of different problems. And uh, KGB uses these anti-establishment feelings to feed this anti-democratic uh, notions, ideas, and perceptions, uh, giving all these images of corrupt uh, Hillary, of uh, bad Democrats, like Biden was connected to this Ukrainian, Russian, Chinese mafia. It was spread through uh, using some real information. But again, they exaggerated this. And uh, because of a new uh, perception of information and consumption information uh, in uh, recent days, when we prefer this source, not a uh, printed source, uh, we became object for manipulation. And the KGB or FSB understood this and they used this for their provocation. And uh, it's not just a uh, presidential campaign. It's attack. Uh, you remember this attack against uh, our energetic energy system in the South. So it's, it's, it's everywhere. And um, this is a danger of um, uh, Putin's uh, FSB and GRU. They uh, use uh, this so-called weakness of the West. Uh, many historians of Russia and historians of uh, KGB, whom I met uh, before finishing my book, KGB Operations Against the United States, and Canada, agreed that uh, Putin uh, found two symbolic signs of American weaknesses, which were used for his new activities. First, failure of January 6th, when American parliament was attacked by democratic people, you know, people who wanted democracy, wanted a removal of establishment, he realized that this power could not protect themselves if these crowds could attack them. And even uh, local president Trump, it could be related to this mob who attacked them. So he realized, no, America is not united. America is weakened. America is divided. So the first uh, example. And uh, Putin loved this story of January 6. And of course, he didn't want um, uh, this uh, criticism of these events by America. He wanted to start his operation before legally uh, President Trump and his opponents would be punished. First reason. The second reason. It's shameful failure from, in Afghanistan. So all the world watched all these, uh, you know, um, pictures of Afghani people running behind the plane. And Putin said, well, the West is divided, it's weak. And uh, America showed that it's not a competitor anymore. So these two facts, according to my conversation with former KGB agents in Kyiv, actually persuaded uh, Putin and his group of advisors that time is ready to create pressure on this old, weak president, I mean, Biden. And we can do this before Republicans would win. And then Republicans will support us. He miscalculated. As you know, many Republicans actually uh, unite their efforts with Democrats criticizing Putin. So it's another interesting case. But of course, he uh, wanted, according to KGB estimation, do this before two events, elections of uh, November 22 and November 24. He wanted the Republican president to be here and restore good personal relations with him. It's his plan. Mm. So, so probably uh, I, I asked your question about nuclear war. 
he's not ready for nuclear war until American elections <laughs> because he wanted to be friend with Republican candidate. So if uh, these sanctions, you, you mentioned he, he said out loud that he doesn't think the sanctions are uh, going to be a problem, but if it really begins to hurt many of these oligarchs, is there a chance there could be some kind of attempt to overthrow him? Boy, I, I'm praying, I'm praying that somebody paid money to kill Puyos, but, but you, need, you, know, you need to understand psychology of Russian people. Who will suffer, not oligarchs, ordinary Russian. They uh, have problems with ruble, problems with uh, distribution of goods. But you forgot the historical mentality of Russian people who used to sacrifice in the name of victory, in the name of patriotism. You remember the story of Leningrad blockade when uh, hungry Soviet residents of Leningrad were fighting against Nazi occupation. You forgot, I remember, still remember uh, stories from my mom who lived in occupied Donetsk, Stalin, it was called Stalin. And she told me how they suffered, but they uh, were ready to suffer because Red Army would come and liberate them from fascists and they would flourish. And they were ready to be patient and sacrifice in the name of victory. What Putin did, and it's his success, he created a new ideology of Russian nationalism, Russian imperialism. Russia is, you know, number one nation. Uh, Russia suffered, but Russia now is great. And using images and uh, facts of World War II, the last war, he unified Russian nation in this strong patriotic bloc. And frankly speaking, these ordinary Russians, especially of my age, of middle age, ready to sacrifice, ready to wait until this rotten America would be punished, according to Putin. And Putin will wait until Americans will elect good president for Putin. And then my Ukraine probably will be subjugated by Russian imperialism forever. Because I, I suspect Republican president would not care about my Ukraine. He will care about new building in Kremlin or good connections with Putin. And Putin actually wait for this. He understand that America is divided. And this is very dangerous. Uh, you know, uh, strategy. So who knows, but I suspect that uh, his next move is to occupy entire Donetsk and Lugansk region. Why? The simple uh, answer. Uh, because he needs access to Azov Sea, because Crimea has no connection to Russia. But if he using these as a pretext, uh, these claims of local leaders in Lugansk and uh, Donetsk restore their authorities all over all their regions. They call it Donetsk Oblast, uh, region of Donetsk, and Lugansk Oblast, uh, region of Lugansk. He will succeed. He will, be, he will have his first victory. He will show his Russian foes, even oligarchs. You blame me for everything you criticize. Now we have access to uh, Crimea through Azov. All Azov is ours. Then they isolate Odessa. They still have ships. And then they will restore so-called Novorossiya, New Russia. It's old imperial uh, province from Alexander the uh, First, Nikolai the First through 19th century. So it's terrible. And you know, again, he will be using uh, um, various pretexts uh, and uh, Americans will not send the troops because Ukraine is not a member of NATO. And step by step, I suspect, and I'm afraid, Ukraine will be subjugated to Russia. And it's, uh, you know, horror for me. I, 
I used to go to my Ukraine every summer, I have my friends, relatives, I love my land. But I'm afraid that, again, uh, it depends on American position or native position, but who knows? Well, here's the hardest question then for you tonight. Um, Marjorie Lyles asked this, uh, what would you do if you were president of Biden right now? You know, I would uh, break NATO rules and send troops to Ukraine. Not to Poland and not to Estonia, but to Ukraine. Because Ukraine, and Biden knows this, CIA knows this, Biden, uh, Ukraine has no regular army and has no uh, navy. It's, it's very, very weak. It just started creating this without a real force, without threat of force, uh, Putin wouldn't stop. And I'm afraid after Ukraine, it will be Poland. After Ukraine, it will be uh, Baltics um, because um, he uh, wouldn't stop. And you need to understand his psychology. He grew up as as a small bully and a poor family in Leningrad, he used to fight, you know, to box. And he knows only one principle, principle of force, principle of punch. And if America would use only diplomatic channels, for Putin, it will be a sign of weakness. And uh, if America would combine these diplomatic measures, so-called sanctions, with real military actions. First actions, very simple. America should send ships to Black Sea and pr protect without any engagement into the war to protect uh, Odessa, Kherson, and Nikolaev in Black Sea area. That's it. Just put their ships, the second, send not troops, but airplanes to establish control over Ukrainian space, airspace. That's it. Otherwise, the next move by this crazy man from Kremlin will be uh, you know, a rocket attack. But if American, uh, and again, Ukraine had no anti-missile uh, uh, technology. What uh, Putin said about American nuclear weapons, uh, excuse me, Ukrainian nuclear weapons is a bluff. Ukraine lost all this potential. He just used this for blackmailing Americans and other people to see this is a rogue nation. This Ukraine has the secret nuclear weapons. It's not true. But if American airplanes would establish control over airspace in Ukraine, it will be a different story. But again, uh, again, I'm not a politician. I'm just a historian who reads books and uh, writes books. All right, we got one last question for you. This is a personal question. Do you ever feel like being outspoken as you are is a creates personal problem for you? Yes, yeah, I, I love to speak. And you need to understand me, uh, before 2014, I was not very patriotic. And I, I didn't care about my Ukraine, about uh, Eastern Europe. I just made money, made money uh, teaching classes uh, everywhere, lecturing. But when my own land, my own house was attacked, you know, I'm from a box. I, I used to protect myself. And now, it's not about my language. I speak actually both Russian and Ukrainian. I don't care about my language, but I love my land. I love my piece of this, you know, my small house in Dnipro. I love this Dnipro River. I love to swim there. I love this mm, uh, smell of my air, my fruits. You know, we have wonderful uh, gardens uh, created by German Mennonites in the 19th century. The best. A cherry gardens in entire Europe were created by German Mennonites who created Ukraine, every culture in Imperial Russia. It's a wonderful land, it's a wonderful story. And 
You know, it's multinational. It's like American. We have Mennonites, we have Jews, we have Greeks, we have Bulgarians. Look at me. I have father who is Greek, mother is Russian, and my grandfather is uh, uh, Ukrainian. I have German, Jewish, uh, Greek blood in my veins. You know, it's typical Ukrainian. You know, we are like Americans. There isn't all these cultures and religions. In my case, it's uh, Mennonite religion. It's um, Protestant Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, Judaism. And I can follow on and on. Yes, I love to be outspoken because I represent my land. And I, I'm proud, you know, that I'm Ukrainian-American. I began studying my American because I loved American rock and roll. I love American literature. I love Faulkner. I love Cooper. I love uh, Mark Twain. I love American movies. I probably know about more about American Hollywood than any of my audience here. And uh, again, uh, I can give you all tracks of any album of Christmas Clearwater Revival. <laughs> it's another example of American Christmas. So I'm proud to be both American and Ukrainian. And I want America now to support us. Millions of Ukrainians live in America. And we pray, Mr. Biden. And I love what Blinken said today. I love Blinken. We pray, Mr. Biden, give some resistance to this bully. Because next nation would be American or Polish nation or whoever. If this bully wouldn't stop in Ukraine, Ukraine would be transformed, God forbid, to new Syria. And then he would follow to Baltics or um, Poland. And you know what he will do? He will blackmail entire world with nuclear rockets. And you know, we need to stop this guy. He's unpredictable. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, I think, time we've uh, gotten to our end of our time period here, but really appreciate your insights and the uh, kind of the passion you bring to this topic. Um, you, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, great. So, um, again, thank all our participants. And uh, as Betty suggested, or, okay, uh, Betty, you want to kind of wrap it up then? Yeah, yeah. I do. Uh, thank you. <laughs> You know, I I agree with you. I was when 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 this was just when the ground was just rumbling uh, a few months ago, uh, and got started getting serious at the end of the year or first of this year. I thought we if we just sent some planes in to buzz over his his mounting troops and we move those ships in. I you know you could appreciate Biden's reluctance. We just got out of Afghanistan and after twenty years, and you could appreciate his reluctance. Uh, and this is a man maybe at 78, he doesn't care about being reelected. I don't know. So he, he might do it. But I was wondering, God, we just did that because Ukraine is no match for me, but he's no match for us. And um, so I don't know, maybe if NATO all together, but I'm not sure that you are. So we put it on, and it's, 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 it's vexing, but we, I think many who have attended this evening agree. But we need American support. We, we need American unity. American unity is success of American story. Well, we don't have much of that right now, as you are aware, and which is a shame. Yeah. And uh, so it's, and, and I think we're all concerned too, if he uses the nuclear weapons, it's it's a different game. And he's, right. he, he's, he, he, he operates in small plane. But yeah. thank you very much. This has been a really excellent program. And uh, I, I'm wondering too, if. Ukrainians, there's going to be a lot of Ukrainians like you with their backs stripping against the wall. They love their land and um, they will fight uh, to the best of their ability. Yeah. Um, and but again, you can fight against tanks and rockets with just machine gun in your hand. No, and, and it is, yes, and they betrayed because they did. They were the third largest nuclear power in the world. Yeah. They, they gave that up to say to us, to the European, and to Russia. And to Russia, yeah. To Russia. We you, we want to guarantee that you will not attack. We will give this up. Yeah. So, I mean, but of course, Putin doesn't care. Putin does yeah, not care any of that. So, thank you. Thank you, you for so your much. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, next week, I've got to mention next week, uh, Sergey, you might join us. We're in a different, different world next week. We're in outer space. <laughs> And uh, we really are. We're going to be talking about the new space war. 
And uh, so please come back and join us. Um, I don't know if Putin's going to be this week. I think I wake up every morning wondering, am I going to turn in the news? Will that be it? Um, I turn, wake up in the middle of the night, turn on my, my phone and think, what will I see? But next week, we're going to take a little bit of a break and go into the outer space. We have three really very, very good people. One of them is a very dear friend of mine uh, who is, uh, they're, they're, they're experts, really world experts in um, the space and space debris. You know, we, some of us, we, we talk about Creedence Clearwater Revival. We have some age mixture here and some of us can remember growing up with Buck Rogers and <laughs> doing phenomenal things but phenomenal things have led to a lot of space debris and you've got now consumers going up into space and and uh so it's no longer just uh, getting a degree in, in in astrophysics from purdue university the cradle of astronauts you could just have a lot of money and build a rocket and go up <laughs> so it's going to be fun please join us uh the the big concern we have out there of course is these things colliding with each other i don't know how many of you watched um don't look up but that kind of sets the pace for what is out there in the outer space and the, and the don't look up is will these things begin to collide and what will happen so come back it's going to be a great program next week um and same time same place for the next two weeks we have great decisions uh and then we will return to a program for distinguished speakers but uh the the, the space war sergey please join us uh and again thank you so much for coming this evening. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks.